And our first speaker will be Malcolm Perry talking on uh, black, black holes and soft hair. Okay. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me here. Um, what I would like to do is to talk about some work that was done by the late Stephen Hawking, myself, Sasha Hako, and Andy Strominger. And what had happened over the last few years is we had got interested in trying to understand something about the information paradox in the light of uh, our new newfound understanding of the infrared properties of quantum field theories. So the precise talk that I want to give today is about our attempt to understand where black hole entropy comes from and how it really originates at a microscopic level. So the first task that we need to undertake is to understand what black hole entropy means to most of us. Most of us think about uh, black hole entropy in terms of thermodynamics, and that's how it was originally conceived. The first law of black hole mechanics was discovered by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, and it tells you how there is a change, infinitesimal change, in the state of a black hole when you throw something in. So if you throw something into a black hole, its mass will change, and that will also be associated with a change in its electric charge and its angular momentum. And those, of course, are the only quantum numbers that you expect a black hole to have on the basis of classical general relativity. Associated with that, there is a change in the area of the black hole event horizon. And all of those quantities can be put together in terms of the formula that you are looking at, the first law of black hole mechanics, which, of course, looks awfully like the first law of thermodynamics. It is, however, not the first law of thermodynamics. Um, for the very simple reason that there is no TDS term sitting in this equation. Although the similarity of kappa dA over 8 pi with TDS is kind of clear for all to see. A second result uh, is the second law of black hole mechanics, which was really discovered first. Uh, it was discovered by Hawking in 1970. And in certain ways, you could regard this as following on from the discovery by Raymo uh, Ruffini and Christodoulou of the irreducible mass. So what it says is that as long as you throw in stuff that has positive energy, then the area of the event horizon will always increase. That, too, is similar to the second law of thermodynamics. And the precise relationship to the laws of thermodynamics was provided by Hawking when he discovered the Hawking temperature of black holes, kappa over 2 pi. And that really gives strength to the ideas of Bekenstein and Hawking that there is a thermodynamic entropy, S equals A over 4, that black hole will have. That's not the only way in which you can think about black hole entropy. There is another way, which is based on the Euclidean formulation of gravitation, where what you do is you think about trying to define the path integral for black hole space times. In that case, what you do is you simply construct the path integral. You use a Euclidicity postulate to define it. And in that case, what happens is that you can evaluate the action um, and identify that with the partition function of the uh, path integral and construct a tree-level description of the black hole. If you do that, what happens is that the event horizon becomes just an irreducible S2 sitting in the Euclidean version of the space-time. The interior of the black hole has been excised because that has got the wrong signature. There is no interior of the black hole. There's just simply this sphere which is the remains of the horizon. And you can evaluate the path integral in the tree-level approximation. That implicitly averages over all of the quantum states of the black hole in as far as they can be seen by external observers. And that gives an answer to the entropy 
and to the temperature, which agrees with the original Hawking derivation and the laws of thermodynamics. The problem is that all of these approaches are thermodynamic in nature and take absolutely no account of any possible microscopic structure. Nevertheless, we all learn uh, the Boltzmann view of entropy, namely that the entropy is equal to the logarithm of the density of states function. And in this particular case, it would be the density of states for fixed m, j, and q. So the question that we are going to address now is what are the quantum states of the black hole? It's very different to what happens in normal thermodynamic systems because the entropy there is extensive. That is to say, it depends linearly on the volume of whatever it is you're computing the entropy of. For the black hole, that is not the case. The, air, the entropy is proportional to the area, and that's just radically different to what usually happens. Also, the black hole you want to regard as being some kind of object sitting in space-time. You don't know about its interior. There's nothing you can do to measure what happens in the interior from the outside. The interior is not static or stationary. So to have an idea of thermodynamics or even of states inside the black hole doesn't seem like the right kind of thing to do. Nevertheless, if quantum mechanics is to hold, and all the evidence is that it does in all of space-time, then you've got to be able to understand the microscopic version of the entropy. So, let's just try to do that. I'm going to use the covariant phase space formalism of general relativity because that's naturally suited to dealing with systems where you have null surfaces as well as space-like surfaces. And after all, the horizon is a null surface. So you're more or less drawn to that kind of treatment. So I'm just going to deal with pure general relativity, no matter. Um, but we'll see later on that that's not going to restrict us too much. So the action for general relativity is just going to be the usual Einstein-Hilbert action, 1 over 6 pi, 16 pi integral of the scalar curvature. And there may be some boundary terms that you add to this for example, the Gibbons, Hawking, York boundary terms, but they're not going to influence anything that we're going to do here. If you vary this action, uh, sending the metric to g plus h, then of course you will find the equation that's of motion in the bulk integral for the action, but you'll also find some surface terms, which I've called here theta. Theta is a functional of the metric of the space-time that you started with, and a perturbation of the metric H, and is usually referred to as the pre-symplectic form of general relativity. Uh, sorry, the pre-symplectic potential uh, three form. It's evaluated on the boundary of whatever bit of space-time you're interested in, but the way you should think of this as being rather like the sum over PI delta QI, where P and Q are the generalized momenta and coordinates. So this is just a sort of covariant way of writing what happens in phase space. If you want a explicit formula for theta, then star of theta is given by just the derivative of h uh, with some various tensorial combinations. The next step is to define something called the pre-symplectic current. And you should regard this as being the sort of uh, object which is essentially the same thing as a symplectic form when you think of Hamiltonian mechanics. You find it by taking the pre-symplectic potential and performing a second variation on it, as shown in the first equation here, so that it's a functional of the background metric G and two variations, H and H prime. This thing is a three form in space-time, and you want to think of the integral over all of space, over a space-like surface sitting in your space-time as being the analog of the symplectic form. You want to think of that as being the same as the sum over dPi wedge dQi. So that really defines the covariant phase space of general relativity. You can, of course, add various matter fields into this if you want. Um, and the way to think about this infinite dimensional object 
is really something which tells you about classical solutions of the Einstein equations. The phase space variables in this way of thinking of things are really just the uh, linearized solutions of Einstein's equations. And you can regard these as being the tangent vectors in this infinite dimensional space. So this object capital omega is really just exactly the same as uh, the usual symplectic form, except that here we've done things in a covariant way. We haven't split up time and space in an arbitrary way. We regarded things in an entirely covariant way of thinking about things. So omega is going to be a two form in the infinite dimensional phase space of general relativity. That enables you, under certain circumstances, to define an co infinite collection of charges. These are the Eyre Lee walled charges, and they're defined by the equation that you're looking at the top here. If you put h to 0, then that object will give you some integral. And if you make the further choice that taking the symplectic form and rather than thinking about an arbitrary h for your second variation, you think about one which is just pure gauge transform with respect to some vector field zeta, then the properties of h and zeta will tell you that instead of having something which you integrate over a three surface, it degenerates down into a boundary integral over a two surface s embedded in the three surface sigma. So if f is a, so if sigma is just some space-like three surface, s can be any closed two surface inside uh, sigma. That will give rise to a charge. This kind of charge you might think of as being initially a rather trivial thing, but in fact it's something that one is well used to. And so some examples are, suppose you picked um, zeta to be any old time translation in sigma, then q would be the quasi-local mass, or a definition of quasi-local mass, in entirely the way that Yao was talking about a little earlier today. That would work for any arbitrary surface S. Another example might be saying that you're going to look at a section of null infinity, in which case that would be a two-sphere. And if the space-time was stationary and zeta the time translation killing vector, then Q would be the Komar mass. But you could do things in a slightly different way. You could say, well, let zeta be a BMS super translation or super rotation in which case Q will be the corresponding super translation or super rotation charges. So this gives you a way of finding charges under a wide range of circumstances. And these are the new soft charges that appear in general relativity and other gauge theories, which uh, give rise to all kinds of interesting infrared effects, um, which I guess are really related to the nature of BMS transformations, since it was Bondi, Metzner, and Sachs that first understood what these things were really about. It's worthwhile having an explicit formula for Q. You, of course, can't divorce Q from its background, and so you can only really calculate what happens if you charge, change the charge or change the space-time between G and G plus H in which case you get a difference in the charges between the two things. That's something which happened in Yao's treatment of the positive mass theorem in exactly the same way. You had to introduce a fiducial Minkowski space time in order to define mass in a, that had positivity properties. This is exactly the same problem. And I think that if you looked carefully, you'll be able to discover that, in fact, we're talking about the same kinds of things, although, uh, I guess, in a slightly different language. So sitting here is an explicit formula for Q in terms of H and zeta. There is one problem that one needs to think about when defining Q in this way. Q must be an exact two-form in the phase space. 
That is, means that if it is not an exact two form in the phase space, Q will not be a function of state, meaning it only depends on the metric H and not and rather than how you got from zero to H. So that's a slightly subtle concept. And to find a Q which is exact in phase space, you may well have to add some other terms to this kind of object. And indeed, exactly the same kind of thing happened in Yao's definition of positive mass and quasi-local mass. These extra terms are, are allowed to arise um, because in the derivation of Q, there were some ambiguities because partial integrations have taken place. And one really has to be very careful about taking account of what these, part, these extra terms on the boundary are going to be. The way their ambiguities were catalogued by Walden Zupas, um, I guess about 20 years ago, um, but I believe this is the first time they have been used uh, to do something uh, which I hope you will find useful. So that defines the charges. You don't really need to know very much about the charges, just simply that they exist. And you can write down some nice formulae for them. As we all know, diffeomorphisms form a Lie algebra. And so if you took the two Lie derivatives of anything and commuted them, you should get the Lie derivative of the commutator. And in a formal sense, the same is true of these charges. So as long as diffeomorphism is a proper invariance of the theory, then the commutator or Dirac bracket of two Qs should be Q of the commutator. That's just an expression of diffeomorphism invariance. Unfortunately, that's not always true. It's possible that if you take the commutator of two Qs and find your new Q, there's some extra stuff left over k, and if k is not equal to zero, you would say that diffeomorphism symmetry had been violated unless you do something about it. So for the rest of this talk, I'll be talking mainly about Kerr black hole space times. Um, and I'm going to only consider what happens to observers sitting outside the black hole. Any observer sitting outside the black hole is going to regard the event horizon as a boundary of the space-time because it's not a region that they can make observations in. This is really an essential ingredient into what happens next. So we're going to regard the event horizon, or at least precise a section of the event horizon, as being a place where one can define these charges. These will be soft charges for the black hole. And uh, I guess we introduced those in a paper which was published in Physical Review Letters about two years ago. Now, in the Kerr metric, you can find a class of vector fields, which you should regard as being these uh, diffeomorphisms, um, which are represented here. Um, to do this, you need to introduce some new coordinates. So I'm going to replace the usual boyer lindquist coordinates, T, R, theta, and phi, by W plus, W minus, Y, and phi, uh, Y and theta, as illustrated here. And there are two quantities which are going to be extra to uh, what's going on here, quantities I will call T left and T right. And they're made from uh, the rotation parameter of the Kerr solution, a equals j over m. The locations of the inner and outer horizons, r plus and r minus. So you get um, a combination of these three new coordinates in terms of t left, t right, and the boyle lindquist coordinates. And the vector field I'm going to look at is given here. It's got a component in the plus direction, which is given by 2 pi t right, e to the 1 plus i n over 2 pi t right times w plus. Zeta y is defined in terms of the same things. Zeta theta and zeta minus are both zero, and n is any integer you like. This uh, object, uh, perhaps it's the best not to ask how we found it, because uh, that was quite complicated, but this object has a Lie bracket which reproduces the Virasoro algebra uh, in its centerless form. So this is an example 
of a collection of vector fields that you'd expect to produce charges that also obeyed uh, the Virasoro algebra. If you replace t pl uh, plus by minus and swap t right and t left, you'll find a second vec family of vector fields that obeys a second Virasoro algebra that commutes with the first. So you can just simply apply the formula for the charges uh, that we looked at before, but you need a counter term to make these charges exact. And the counter term is given here. It's just simply a combination of the zetas and the h's, together with something which is intrinsic to the horizon, namely the volume of the normal bundle to the horizon. Um, it's interesting to note that Yao had a very similar expression when dealing with uh, his definition of quasi-local mass. But bear in mind, this is not quasi-local mass because zeta is any of these harmonics labeled by all of the integers. So what happens if you evaluate the Dirac bracket of these charges? The answer is that they do indeed obey an object like the Virasoro algebra but with a central term given by i n cubed times j, j being the angular momentum of the black hole, times delta of n plus m uh, and zero. This corresponds to a conventional central charge when properly normalized as being 12 j. Any observer which is exterior to the black hole will observe a violation of diffeomorphism invariance unless they can find a way to cancel this term. Since we regard diffeomorphism invariance as the central thing in general relativity, there had better be a way of doing this. To see what that is, it's useful to go back to the prehistory of black hole physics and think about calculations of scattering in the Kerr black hole space time. So I want to consider what happens if you throw in a quantum of energy delta E, angular momentum delta J, and look at the absorption probability uh, for that particle uh, in the black hole space time. By absorption, I mean fall into the black hole. It's a complicated expression, but it involves two gamma functions, which you can see here. And, uh, this is something which has been known for a very long time. However, it's not just in Kerr black hole physics that you see this formula. This formula is something which is known from scattering in condensed matter physics, where you consider two-dimensional systems that have uh, conformal invariance. It corresponds to the absorption probability for a conformal field theory in which the left movers in the space time have temperature TL, the right movers have temperature TR, and for quantity, quanta of energies omega L and omega R. So this formula here, uh, P, works in two remarkably different physical scenarios. So what we do is we just simply say any observer that is sitting outside the black hole will see a conformal field theory sitting on the horizon characterized by a central charge CL and CR, both equal to 12J, and temperature T left and T right corresponding to the temperatures that you have. If an observer does not see this, it means that they would violate conformal, uh, diffeomorphism invariance, and so what you would do is you simply say, well, the observer has got to see that. Come what may, that's something that is going to appear to be there. The entropy of any conformal field theory in dimension two is given by a formula here at sufficiently large temperatures, a formula due to, originally due to Cardi. And this really follows from conformal invariance and nothing else. And it says that the entropy is equal to pi squared over three C left, T left, plus C right, T right. And if you plug in the results that you get from the Kerr metric, you will find this is precisely equal to S equals A over four. So what this means is that this notional conformal field theory has in principle 
all of the information in it to account for the states of the black hole on the assumption that Boltzmann's formula is the correct one. So that should give you some way of trying to understand how black holes store information. There's some points to be made about this. First of all, you can do the same thing in Kern-Newman. It's just a bit more complicated. The final results also hold in the Schwarzschild metric, although if you go back to looking at TL and TR, you'll see they blow up as A goes to zero. But CL and CR are also going to zero, and that kind of degeneracy will cancel out. So that means you really can't find this if you just looked at Schwarzschild. This treatment is inherently holographic. It's treating everything that you find as sitting on the event horizon. Of course, that's the boundary of what you can see, and that is the nature of holography. You've encoded three-dimensional information in something which is inherently two-dimensional. This, however, is not a solution to the issue, although it might be a step towards it. Uh, for one thing, it's unclear how information gathered in gravitational collapse or by throwing something into the black hole encodes itself into the states of this quantum field theory. Also, there's the issue of uh, what's called the species problem, and that is simply that if you thought that black hole entropy was because of you were recording all of the information in collapse, if you multiply the number of elementary particles by a million, then the entropy should go up by a corresponding quantity. The Hawking entropy does not have that property, and neither does the entropy we've just derived, and it's unclear how that could possibly happen um, unless you want to make some interesting speculations. Lastly, on this basis, we should think about what happens to freely falling observers. They don't regard the event horizon as the boundary of space-time, and they see nothing. So that should be regarded as an explanation, at least at a qualitative level, of black hole complementarity. There is some related work. Strominger and Waffer found a conformal field theory from string theory that has many of the properties of the, the entropy here that we have. And in many ways, you can regard what they did, which works only for supersymmetric configurations in string theory um, as being a special case, and also the treatment of Kerr CFT you should regard as being a special case. So that's where I think I want to stop. Uh, what we have done is to find, we hope, a microscopic, microscopic explanation of what black hole entropy is about, and we are continuing to work on these problems, and what you see here is us hard at work. Unfortunately, in the middle of this work, we lost Stephen Hawking, and it's hard to know how one should remember him, but I think he would have liked this. Thank you, Malcolm. <coughs> it's uh, Thomas Hirschfeld. <laughs>